whole fields of scholarship function by reading human dynamics exclusively in terms of privilege and oppression, guilt and victimhood, and cast whole demographic groups as good or evil. My guest for this episode, Peter Bogosian, is famous, among others, for having studied and mimicked such grievance study scholarship with the help of his friends James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose, whom we have both already interviewed on the podcast. Peter is a philosopher interested in how to think rigorously and how to discuss efficiently in order to test one's beliefs and update them. At a time when the proponents of grievance studies are attempting to convert everyone to their simplistic and divisive worldview, a worldview that is obsessed with group identity and that demands total orthodoxy, we are happy to feature this interview of someone who made the effort to study and understand grievance studies in depth. Hi everyone, I'm thrilled to be here with Professor Peter Bogosian. Peter, welcome to the podcast. No, thanks for having me on, Vincent. I'm very happy to have you on. Um, so you are an assistant professor of philosophy at Portland State University. That is correct. Uh, you received your doctoral degree in 2004 from the same university, I think. And uh, the title of your thesis was Socratic Pedagogy, Critical Thinking, Moral Reasoning and Inmate Education, an Exploratory Study. Your research has covered topics such as the philosophy of science, pedagogy, the, natu the nature of belief, religion, etc. And uh, you're perhaps most famous for carrying out with James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose, what you call the Grievance Studies Probe, which also has been dubbed the so-called Square Affair. And uh, so we already discussed the probe on the podcast with Alan Sokal himself, actually. Uh -huh. And um, I'm pretty sure that our discussion will lead us to mention it again. We, we won't focus it on it directly today. Um, I should mention that you... I uh, recently wrote a book with James Lindsay, uh, which is called uh, How to Have Impossible Conversations. And um, people can find you on Twitter at Peter Bogosian. Yep. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you about what you called ID laundering, which has right. been taking place in academia. I don't know if you want to just take it from here or if you would like me to ask a more specific question whatever um, whatever your show you're you're the boss yeah <laughs> okay so maybe i can sort of you know um maybe stimulate you with 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 a quote sure. that i took from from your own uh, actually uh article so just to to briefly explain the general mechanism of id laundering and then you can elaborate on that sure. so you wrote that Quote, the reason you've heard them, so meaning, um, you know, ideas which have been laundered, according to you, through academia, the reason you've heard these ideas, meaning, you know, everyone has heard them by now, is that politically engaged academicians have been developing concepts uh, for more than 30 years, and all that time they've been percolating And only recently have they begun to emerge in, ma in mainstream, excuse me, culture. And these academics accomplish this by passing off their ideas as knowledge. So this that's is the correct. quote. I, I, I yeah. think that's from the Wall Street Journal piece. Is that correct? I think so, yeah. So that's correct. And that's what we see happening. That's Brett Weinstein's term. And we were over at his house one night and he said that to us to with Mike Nana, the documentary filmmaker from Australia and, mm -hmm. and, and Jim and Helen. And so when you want to figure out, so what happens is a group of academicians get together who have strong moral impulses about a topic. It doesn't really matter what the topic is, excuse me, and they discharge those moral impulses in a journal. In other words, they get together and they write about whatever the topic is, they make their own journals, they take an idea that's just an idea, it goes into the journal, and then it 
undergoes the peer review process, whereas experts in the field look at it and deem it acceptable to be added to the canon. And then on the other side, when it comes out, it's washed or laundered as knowledge. Yes. So maybe to make it more specific for the audience, um, you know, what sort of ideas w- would that be? Well, I think, I mean, you you could literally do anything. Microaggressions, yeah. trigger warnings, safe spaces, those were hot in 2017. Fast forward mm-hmm. three years later, you have the best-selling, the New York Times best-selling book dominating the charts on Amazon mm-hmm. across all platforms, Kindle, uh, um, audiobook, etc., is Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility. A couple of versions of that, 2015 and 2018. Last time I looked, it had 1,703 citations, and then the top site number of citations there was 2,200 and something. Okay, so let's 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 slow the conversation down so that this is mm-hmm. clear to everybody. And if at any point. Uh, what I'm saying is not clear. Let me know, and I'll try to be more clear. So sure. everybody in the world can go to, or in the English-speaking world, can go to Google Scholar. It's just scholar.google.com. And what scholar.google.com is, is it's a Google's scholarly site where you can look at you can, you know, take, uh, so, so let's say you put in a book, like, uh, you know, how to have impossible conversations. It will tell you how to format that according to APA MLA standards, which are their, you know, Chicago style, the style if you want to publish. And this is a search engine for peer-reviewed literature and scholarship. Mm-hmm. And... <clears throat> There is a button when you push something in. So if you go to, I'm on, I'm walking now, so I'm, I can't do it. But if you put in white fragility, it will tell you the number of citations the book has. And then you can click on that citations. I think it's 1,703, but, and then it will tell you the, the papers that cited that work. So it's, it's akin to the famous I stood on the shoulders of giants, but in this case, I, I've stood on the shoulders of other people who have just made shit up. So from that, from Google Scholar, you can see how many times a peer-reviewed paper has been cited and then trace its history because those papers can be indexically organized uh, according to when they were published. Is that clear? Yes, so far so good. Okay, so <laughs> so what happens is we now have public policies made on ideas that don't have to be tethered to reality. So those ideas don't have to conform to well to, to anything. They do need a kind of internal consistency though. They, 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 it's like the, um, I don't know if you're familiar with comics. I'm not a big comic book guy. Are you familiar with comic? I, let me, let me tell you something I am familiar <laughs> with. Are, are you familiar with Star Trek and Star Wars? Well, it's a bit. You can be forgiven for the Star Wars, but you're dead to me if you don't know what Star Trek is. Anyway, <laughs> so in, in Star Wars, they have these, these lightsabers, right? Yeah, yeah. And in Star Trek, they do not have lightsabers. So mm-hmm. Star Trek has its own ecosystem. Star Wars has its own ecosystem. And to function within that ecosystem, you need to know what the rules are. So you, you mm-hmm. can't just put in um, you just can't put in a lightsaber or, or someone using the force, for example, in Star in Star Trek. Mm-hmm. In in the same way as there's an ecosystem. There's a scholastic ecosystem that operates. You, you can't have certain things will fly or will pass in certain ecosystems that make sense and cohere in philosophy. It's kind of, we call it coherence theory. It's kind of like a coherence theory of truth. It doesn't have to correspond to anything real. 
but you can look at these as individual points in a nexus of belief that all have a coherence architecture. It's kind of like an architectonic structure in which things are built upon themselves and connected, etc. You can also look at it like a building. So is, is that clear so far? Yeah. Okay. So none of those things need to be predicated upon anything that's real. And again, right. only because it's 2020. And you could do that with anything, but I think the best example in this moment is white fragility. You can, I just read Jonathan Church's manuscript on totally deconstructing that. It's a tactical nuclear strike to that book. Um, it's fantastic. I can't recommend it enough. It's the whole idea. Of, and James Lindsay at New Discourses has published extensive stuff on that. It's kind of like the idea of white, of, of he calls it, Nazi fragility, which is a very funny tweet he put out. Or you could, you could do anything. You could put it with rhinoceros fragility. You're <laughs> afraid of rhinoceroses. No, I'm not. See, that's what someone who's afraid of rhinoceroses would say. <laughs> I, so the whole thing is, it, it, it's, it, it's so childish and so absurd, but yet it taps on these visceral moral impulses that we have. And the genius thing about this is, as that... Also, through the process of idea laundering, there is a structure, a scholastic infrastructure in place that makes it so that it, it gives a legitimate or, or, or an ostensibly legitimate reason to mm -hmm. not engage other ideas. They don't value dialogue, discourse, dialectic. They have their own terms. Judith Butler calls it non-consensual co-platforming in which they don't even want their articles alongside of people who disagree with them. And in the history of Western intellectual thought, since Socrates and perhaps it could be argued the pre-Socratics, we are up to Heidegger in the present day. We have this, um, excuse me, Habermas the present day. We have this idea that, you know, what, what, is, what does it mean to, to know something? How do you know? How do you challenge? What's a dialectic? What's the importance of, you know, the Alinkus or the Socratic method? And, how do we come to truth? How do we try to falsify the, our ideas, which is big in science from Popper? And all of that is just washed away. So these ideas then of, in this case, we're talking about white fragility, so I'll just use that. And the idea of white fragility, it gets idea laundered. Plus, on top of that, there's an additional architecture that prevents those ideas from being challenged within. And if they're challenged externally by someone like Jonathan Church, then they don't have to engage them because they just say it's racist. Or, mm -hmm. well, that's just white fragility manifesting itself. So, so there can be no legitimate criticism of an idea under this ideological paradigm. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, but so uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but I had also written something. I was not familiar with the concept of ID laundering, but I had written something in Quillet which kind of converges with what you're explaining, I think. Um, because, you know, th there, is, there was this, this sort of uh, phenomenon that happened in, in several steps uh, in, in academia. You know, first you had maybe in the, in the 60s and the 70s um, and also in the 80s and the 90s, you had, you had many scholars who started accusing science of collaborating with misogyny, racism, yes. etc. And they um, they decided to marginalize the scientific method in uh, entire fields of study. And um, then within this new paradigm of, well, you know, with, with the scientific method set aside, they, they started producing a lot of you know, academic content. It's not scientific content, but it, right. it has the the academic seal of approval. As as you were mentioning, it's it's in journals and it, it gets cited, and you can track it on Google Scholar now. And um, they have produced a lot of literature uh, defending these activist ideas. And then so, once yeah, this ahead. is done, they can just turn around and see, oh, well, you see the scientific liter literature is on our side. Right. Right. So, OK, so a few things there. You said a lot. You, you can look mm. at that 
from many perspectives. I'd highly recommend Helen Pluckrose's new book. Uh, she's the first off of Cynical Theories from Pitchstone Press. It explains mm-hmm. that in tremendous detail. And it should be out pretty soon, but I think that the COVID uh, yeah. cri- crisis has delayed production of that. But anyway, okay. that, that traces that out. You know, and it gets back yeah. to, and you see that with Catherine McKinnon and, and they talk about pornography, et cetera. And that's what we try to do in one of our papers about uh, uh, porn and the elephant test. You can find those papers online. But underneath this whole thing lies the idea that Aubrey Lord's idea, which is you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Reason mm-hmm. in this you know, worldview, this frame, this, 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 it really is this uh, a world, this ideo- ideological paradigm. Reason is a construction of white people in the patriarchy. And you can't dismantle the inherent structures of patriarchy and white supremacy with the master's tools, reason, the scientific method. You can't dismantle, excuse me, can't dismantle the master's house with those tools. So you need not a parallel set of tools, which gets back to idea laundering. You need a Mm -hmm. completely new set of tools to dismantle the master's house. Um, But the, the problem with that is it's like, you know, the famous quotation, it's like the horse in Alice in Wonderland that, that rides off furiously in all directions. When you don't anchor something, your beliefs to to the evidence to to, uh, to the scientific method. If you don't retether those to reality, then it's basically what what your belief is is subject to cultural capriciousness. Right? It's it's arbitrary. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot going on there. Uh, and I and I said a lot, and that probably sh- should be unpacked. But you, you know your audience better than I do, so if something was unclear, let let me know because there's just a ton. There's, it's a very it it seems simple, but it's a very very complicated idea, and and that's also why I think I, I um, sent you the piece, "Deluded Departments," that I published in the Flossers magazine as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think. Yeah, you're right that uh, there, there are, <laughs> you know, there is this very, this very strong claim, you know, that science or reason is racist or reason is sexist, and it seems, it seems simple, but it, it's uh, it's important to really, you know, dig deeper to understand what is meant by that. Um, w- w- what I've noticed, I I don't know what you what. what you will make of this, but to me it seems that these days, I mean nowadays at least, um, not so many people will defend these claims in their strong version. You know, uh, like reason is reason is racist, reason is sexist. They will use them from time to time, but also when it's not needed, they will just say. You know, they they will they will point at the um, the ID laundered academic literature. That's exactly and they will correct. Say, and they will say, well, it's on our side. So it's kind of a kind of a dance in, in yep. that has two movements, and they can go back and forth. Yep, that's correct. And they actually have it opposite to to what it really is. It's reason and evidence that allows you to figure out. If, for example, there is systemic racism in police departments, there is reason and evidence. I, you, you, you could use it literally for anything. I'm just using that example because it's hot right now. Uh, to, mm-hmm. to figure out if you want to take a look at shootings of black men by white officers, black officers by region, by crime. I mean, it's the scientific method that enables you to look at those problems and realign your beliefs. To reality, and absent that, it's just guesswork. You know, they call it it's, it's epistemic luck. You could be anybody can be epistemically lucky about anything. You can just guess. But if you want to increase the confidence, if you want to calibrate your confidence toward knowledge, you can say, "I know this, and here's how I'm justified." You need actual evidence, and 
pieces that have been laundered because someone has a moral impulse, those are not evidence. And, you know, one of the papers that we wrote was kind of feels weird to talk about this now because I think the whole thing is lost. But I think the whole battle is lost at this point. Um, but one of the things that we wrote about was fat studies. So, you know, fat studies doesn't use the word obesity because it's a narrative. Lots of stuff right. has come out. And actually, a piece was just published very recently by, I think his name is Goff Cole, Jeff Cole, um, arguing that our paper in the journal Fat Studies, which is the flagship journal of the discipline of the same name, mm -hmm. argued that there should be a space in competitive bodybuilding for fat people where they go and they show off their fat in non-competitive ways. And this guy argued that the paper should be reinstated. And we wrote a response piece. I have no idea if it will get published or not. Um, mm -hmm. Frankly, I don't think it will be published because um, that would go against, we'll see if I'm right or wrong. But the, uh, <laughs> we had a back and forth with the author and he more or less, I uh, wasn't on those initial emails, but he more or less uh, invited us to write a piece in response. I'm not exactly sure how that came up, so I don't want to say, say exactly, but anyway, the three of us wrote a response piece I don't think that they're going to publish it because it, it goes against their narrative. It's all about narrative, mm -hmm. right? It's all about stories. It's, it's in philosophy, we call it the subjective turn. It's a turn away from objectivity towards subjectivity, yeah. towards standpoint epistemology. But it's not, this is what people don't understand. It's not a turn away from the fact that there's an objective world. I, I suppose some fringe lunatics would believe that, but the vast majority right. of uh, scholars trafficking and applied postmodernism, which is what Helen calls it, uh, of the pomoid cluster. The vast majority of these people take uh, Foucault's idea, knowledge power, he had one word for it, and look at systemic uh, in institutionalizations of power and how power plays, plays out in society. So, again, we're talking about something that's extremely complicated and for people to just jump in is more difficult than, than one would think. Most people don't even know what a peer-reviewed paper is, right? So, mm -hmm. so in, and then among the people who know what a peer-reviewed paper is, as far as I know, and I, I, I will stand by this claim, I do not think people who are trained in philosophy uh, receive specific training in, this, in the scientific method. And I think mm -hmm. that's why certain disciplines are unhinged. We published another piece uh, for the Philosopher's Magazine. If you want to be good at philosophy, study math and science. <laughs> and I think that's an extremely important idea. And one of the reasons people go astray, for example, is that they'll speculate, you know, what, what is the meaning of, 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 of or, uh, let me give you another one in metaphysics. They'll say things like, um, what is the ground of all being or the foundational, uh, you know, ask those, all those, you know, sorts of um, primary metaphysical questions. Those are, not you can't reason for those. You need some kind of evidence. I don't know what the evidence would be. I'm not in that field. I don't know, like a large hydron collider stuff you collect from that. I don't know. I'm not a physicist, but, <laughs> but you can't just, you can't just speculate about stuff. And, you know, people, right. people get, get hoodwinked, hoodwinked. Dan Dennett writes his, about this, one of my favorite quotations. Dan Dennett's a professor of philosophy from Tufts. And Dan wrote that um, if it's not <laughs> worth doing, it's not worth doing well. If it's not right. worth doing, so s spending hour upon hour, year upon year, decade upon decade, and even, I may say, century on century, if you include the history mm. of certain aspects of the philosophical tradition, pondering about the underlying nature of reality is probably a total waste of time. In fact, not only is it a total waste of time, but the problem with that is you think that you've acquired something real because other people have seriously entertained the question. But mm -hmm. the, the question is answered by, you know, like Heisenberg's Udning der Wirklichkeit, or the question is answered by physics. It's not answered by people who have no training in the Socratic, I mean, in the, in the uh, scientific method, and then constructing Ursop's lines of literature about it. 
It's just silly. But but the problem th- there is that they then assign those beliefs high confidence, higher confidence values than they ordinarily should. Now take that whole concept, bracket it, and apply it to to anything with a moral balance, right? So if, if it has a moral undergirding mm-hmm. and people yeah. have these moral impulses, then they calibrate their confidence even higher, right? Right. Because, because at least we know, well, you know, racism is bad. There are black people, there are white people, there has been slavery. Like there are these facts about reality. Mm-hmm. So there's more to latch on to which then causes the artificial increase in confidence in the suite of beliefs responsible for belief formation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's quite interesting, actually, because I was planning to ask you, um, you know, how, how it's possible that for decades this ID laundering process took place. But I think you've already answered that to, to, uh, to a good extent by, uh, you know, mentioning that you have disciplines in which... People are, uh, you know, not so close to the scientific method and they have these moral commitments and indeed they really, um, they tune their, you know, the, 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 their credences, the credences they put in, yes. in their beliefs uh, according to these moral commitments. Yes. And I, I also like, in case any of your listeners are like, wow, that's interesting, or I'd like to learn more, or maybe they think, oh, no, that's bullshit. Okay, I would, again, second time, mention cynical theories. It's all there. Every single mm-hmm. thing traces out in minute detail how this happens. Foucault, Derrida, Leotard, up to the modern day. And then translates that into why we're seeing what we're seeing in society. Riots, white fragility, people freaking out. Mm-hmm. And one more ingredient we haven't mentioned in, is that in many of these fields, you know, I mean, not only do, do scholars have moral commitments, not only do they um, often let these commitments get the better of them, but they tend to more or less all have the same commit commitments, yes. which really um, completely undermines, yes. uh, you know, um, processes of correction of confirmation bias at the collective level it doesn't work anymore yes let's linger on that if you don't mind so yeah it's also desirability bias and it's the calling out of intellectual diversity out of the system i've spoken about that extensively i don't want to in fact i just went on tour a little while ago before the pandemic with the guy mm-hmm. who heads ratio christi uh and we who's the main christian organization on campuses and our talk was titled a christian and an atheist i'm the atheist he was the christian uh something like you know stand up stand together uh uh, for intellectual diversity in the university system so what happens Mm -hmm. getting back to the star trek star wars thing (laughs) if i geek out too much let me know but you have (laughs) ecosystems you have ecosystems in the university and they have systematically called diverse voices it's a little, I don't know if you know the, the, uh, the expression inside baseball, but <clears throat> what's happening now with Bruce Gilley at Portland State University is fascinating. His department, <clears throat> excuse me, his department has really come for him. He's the guy who wrote the piece, The Case for Colonialism. Okay. And whether or not you think that's an insane idea is totally irrelevant to this conversation. What is relevant is he played by the rules of the game. He published a yeah. paper in a peer-reviewed journal, but that paper upset people. The journal editor was threatened with death. They had to remove the paper from the journal, et cetera. The coin of the realm mm-hmm. in this game is publishing. And, and which is another thing, I published a piece in the American Mind, Culture War 2.0, that talks about this, that these, this new ideology that, that's been almost exclusively idea laundered, if not exclusively idea laundered, they don't play by the rules of engagement. So what they did to Gilly was, they wanted his PhD. Think about that. Someone publishes an article in a peer reviewed journal you don't like. You don't rebut the article. You don't argue against it. You don't challenge him to a debate or even have a com- offer to have a conversation with him. No, those are all, this, this is the new religion. And what they do in the new religion is they take the tools from the old religion. 
You know, he's committed a secular blasphemy. They threatened to kill the journal editor. They they want his PhD. They want his tenure. They want his so mm-hmm. so. There's something more insidious operating when the mechanism that we see is um, is that there, it, 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 when you call voices that are not diverse, and I want to say one more thing about this because it's so important. Not only do you create your own ecosystem, but you artificially increase the confidence in the beliefs held by members of that community because you don't hear the other side of the issue. And that makes your epistemology brittle because when you do hear it, you're mortified, you're horrified. That's very easy to dehumanize people to other people. Now, here's the genius of this whole thing. The genius underlying this whole thing is diversity. So diversity does not mean what people think it means. It it, diversity explicitly means no intellectual diversity. It means intellectual homogeneity, preferably with a very strong preference toward people who have different sexual orientations, different cis orientations, different races, different ability statuses, different weights, etc. So you've smuggled in a moral infrastructure, if you will. You've repaved the scholastic roads. You've reformed them. Part of this is a function of university architecture because you have institutions, you have mechanisms in the university which have weaponized themselves to punish divergent voices like offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or if you want to be less sympathetic, DIE, diversity, the die religion, (laughs) bias response teams where people can report, you can even report somebody anonymously. So you, you have mechanisms, you create an architecture in which you have enforcement mechanisms in place to punish dissenters and blasphemers. And all the while, you continue to call voices out of the system. So then the beliefs that you hold, not only are they never challenged at all, but if they are, if someone dare challenges them, then they go to the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or they have various mechanisms weaponized against them. I mean, it's such Mm -hmm. an insidious problem. (laughs) That's why I think that the universities are over, and I think they should fail, and I think they should be defunded. I used to believe certain departments should be defunded, but the problem with that is that we actually do need to study issues of gender, race, sexuality. These are extremely important, but we need to do this right. We need to do them with the scientific method. I no longer believe these disciplines are able to to self-correct. I no longer, and I'm not the first one by any means, Charlotte or Stern, people have been saying this for years. Mm. Uh, I, I'm certainly not the first one to say this. Oh, and back to the fragility thing, what's on my mind. You know, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff have written a, a lot of stuff, and not just in the coddling about that. So that's another resource for listeners if they want to check it out. <laughs> but yeah. um, so, so, so we have we have a problem. Now, here's the landscape. So, so we have a problem in which the universities are incapable of reform. It's, I've been saying for years, screaming at the top of my lungs, like, reform, you've got to do this, no, you're a Nazi, blah, 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 okay. My daughter's a, a, a doctor from China, uh, and she said, Dad, you're a terrible Nazi. Yeah, I know. But, so, so I don't believe, even if these, you know, let's say you divide the universities into four tiers, with the first year being the Ivy League and the West Coast Ivy, like Caltech. Mm-hmm. Stick MIT in there, too. And then second, third tier. So third and fourth tier schools are screwed. Second tier schools are in probably fine. First tier schools are 100% fine. They have zero to worry about. Billions of endowments. Everybody wants to send their kid to Harvard. They have no problem. So part of the problem is even if we defund universities, with, with federal funding because they've become ideology mills that seek to instill people with grievances. And then those people leave the university and 
you know, four to five, seven years become leaders. And now look at this fucking catastrophe we're in because of the grievance ideology, right? People you say, oh, it's just a few people in the human, a few fringe lunatics in the humanities. Well, now look where we are. But the problem is, even if you were to get rid of somehow almost magically the second tier schools in that list, you'd still be left with the first tier schools who uh, in in these disciplines. And now it's invaded STEM. It's completely invaded STEM. Well, you'll have a position in which ideologues will still be in control and then the weight of their scholarship. There's no there's still no way to stop ideal laundering. Like, it, it's just too late. And the funny thing is, it would have been so easy to just give lip service to this in the beginning. So easy. Like, remember I told you, I mentioned Bruce Gilley? So mm-hmm. he, put, he put forward a course of Portland State, conservative political thought. And I think it's worth mentioning that he describes himself not as a conservative, but as a moderate. But that's Steven Pinker's left pole, right? If you're on the left... Right. Anyone who's even a little bit to the left, if you're on the left pole, anyone who's even a little bit to the right of you is a Nazi. So Mm -hmm. he self-describes as a centrist moderate. He just told me that a few months ago. Uh, And again, I I repeated asking him, but you you have him on your show. You ask him yourself. Um, (laughs) He he wanted this this, uh, course, conservative political thought, but it was denied because, quote, it didn't have enough diversity. Mm. Now, everybody in their right mind knows that's not why the course was denied, right? But but let's let's just say that's true. What do we have now? Last poll I read, it's been a while ago, slightly more than 80% of people who self-identify in the United States, I can't speak for where you are, I don't know the, the data, um, who self-identify as conservatives do not trust universities. And I would say that the other 20-ish percent or 17 percent or whatever it is should be 100 if they knew what happened in universities. But all you would have had to do was to approve Gilly's course. And then when there's some right wing, one of my colleagues said to me, oh, the, the, you know, every time I see, I won't name the institution where I teach, every time I see the institu- this institution, there's, there's, you know, it's always in right wing media. OK, and it's mm-hmm. always, OK, well, guess what? You can fix that. This is not complicated. You doing this to yourself. You put Gilly's class in there of conservative political thought. And the next time the right wing media come to you and say, this is an ideological cesspool where you're just training people. You're just the whole purpose of this is to indoctrinate them. You say, and it would be somewhat true. You say, no, that's just not true. Look, we have Bogosian over here challenging all kinds of beliefs, right, left, center. We have Gilly with the class and conservative political thought. So that criticism is simply untrue. That would have been so effortless to do. Plus, he wants to teach the course, so you just don't know like you have to pay him. But that's what happens when you're in an ideological echo chamber, when you're in an, an, um, a created ecosystem, is that your beliefs are calibrated so high it's like a dial that you've turned up so much that anything unless there's ideological not just congruity but purity it's not an epistemological problem it then becomes a moral problem right it's not that oh this person just lacks this piece of information it's holy shit we can't teach people conservative political thought i mean i think we should teach people conservative political thought for a number of reasons it, it satisfies Mill's dictum, right? I think it should be taught by people who believe it. But anyway, but the point is, this all relates to intellectual diversity, how it's smuggled in, university architecture, the erosion of confidence in, the, in our public institutions, particularly our academies, all of this and idea laundering, all of this lends to a legitimation crisis, which we're now seeing. I think Habermas was, Jürgen Habermas, the German philosopher, first popularized that. And you're in Germany now. Mm-hmm. I, think he's, I think he's still living. Um, I think uh, so, we're yeah. Seeing, yeah, we're seeing a crisis in our institutions, the crisis of the World Health Organization, the crisis of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Our president is a fucking lunatic. So, and I'm, I didn't vote for him, so don't, don't blame me. Uh, so we're <laughs> seeing a, a complete crisis, a legitimation crisis, manifest by the creation of 
of um, b- b- the creation and buttressing of an ideology of a worldview put in place by idea laundering. Yeah, I, I was meaning to ask you about the, the various disciplines in, in academia. And I, I mean, <laughs> I know that now, you, now you've made clear. And also, I was listening to your discussion with uh, David Silverman. You've made clear that you're very pessimistic about the, um, you know, the future of the universities. But, um, you know, f- for decades, <laughs> yeah. we, can, we can come to that, I guess, uh, in in a few minutes, but I, I wanted to ask you, and I think we, we'll, we'll actually get to that very naturally because I, I, I wanted to say that, you know, for, for decades, um, you know, these ideologies that have been ID landed, they were in the social sciences and the humanities. Um, I think your, you know, your grievance studies probe showed that Um, some disciplines were more resistant to the nonsense than others. Yes. Uh, sociology journals, for instance, didn't didn't publish your your fake papers, um, unlike the the gender studies, fat studies, and whatnot. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I think there is some clear porosity in in sociology to to these ideas. But um, the point I wanted to make is that now I see. That uh, I mean, today uh, actually, uh, today is a day uh, when um, scientists, people working in the in the natural science, right. in the natural sciences, excuse me, are pushed by um, various, you know, um, publishing houses, various institutions in, in science, right. not to work. There's this right. hashtag shut down STEM. And yep. um, it's, 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 I mean, it's ev- yeah. It's evergreen all over. It's evergreen mm-hmm. all over. And and I wrote about this, the precursor to this in my first book, A Manual for Creating Atheists. Not only is this evergreen all over, but these are invasive, exogenous values that have terrestrialized the academy and people in that orbit. These are not These are anti-liberal values. And by the way, if anybody's a conservative listening to this, please stop using the word liberal as a criticism for authoritarians. These people doing this stuff are the opposite of liberals. So stop it. Knock it off. It's muddying the conversation. So I I don't see how with an erosion of public trust expedited by COVID, I don't understand... I don't think that the universities can survive. They have so many problems, not least of which, I mean, we haven't even talked about a lot of the problems, which is somewhat outside the scope of the conversation, but we need to start talking about what's going to replace the university because they are the gems of American exceptionalism and they, they ought to continue to be the engines of knowledge production. But the problem is that they they are not. I mean, you know, in, in these in these fields. And now, okay, I mean, it would be an exaggeration to say that um, you know the the science the science fields are all screwed totally just because there was this hashtag that pushed people not to work for one day, but instead read all ah, these okay all these so, ID London manifestos. Yeah, right, please so, please go. <laughs> So we need to talk about other things to enhance this. We need to go a little bit deeper. And yeah. I spoke about this. I've spoken about this before. I would urge people to Google and then not just Google, but dig deeper on this idea of research justice. So mm-hmm. this is peak peak crazy. I'm going to take a break from that. So what's your background real quick? Yeah, I'm a physicist. I studied physics and I still... I'm a, I'm a physics researcher. Okay, so this is this is <laughs> this is perfect. I hope you're sitting because I don't want to give you a heart attack about what I'm about to say. <laughs> so, so okay. uh, research justice is the idea that you only cite in a paper people from marginalized communities. Right. You de you de-emphasize white heterosexual men. You know, like if you're writing a physics paper, Lawrence Krauss is a good friend of mine. You don't you don't cite you know. Krauss. I don't know anything about physics, but whatever Krauss has published in these extraordinarily well published, you don't cite any of that stuff. 
So what happens is you skew. It's no longer based on merit, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I'd like to reframe this. The lens through which I'd like to reframe this conversation is we already have the solutions to the vast majority of these problems, and that's a quality of opportunity, not a quality of outcome. So instead of trying to jerry-rig the system on the, out, on, on the back end, oh, we need more women in science, and you know, there's some really good stuff in the, the Swedish paradox about that. The more freedom people are given, the more gendered roles, professions they'll take. Peterson, many people have written about this extensively. But the yeah. idea is that we have the mechanisms already in place in, from the Enlightenment, liberalism, equality of opportunity from John Rawls, public education of the first rate, my own personal, I'll throw my own personal spin in that. I believe everybody should be given uh, access to free health care. I believe everybody should be given a universal basic income. That's, I was a big supporter of Andrew Yang in the last presidential election. Um, but you, you can bracket the last two. But the whole idea of research justice and the whole idea of, of um, that we would limit our knowledge based upon the sex and gender of, of researchers, that's an anathema to what science is. The whole idea of science is that you're able to understand questions not be, you could measure, you know, 186,000 miles per second or, you know, uh, 451 degrees Fahrenheit or 9.8 meters per second squared. So I'm falling in vacuum, speed of light, paper burns. You, it, you can be, a, 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 you know, a Samoan in 100 years ago. Everybody will. There's an idea in philosophy it's called convergence. Everybody will converge. They'll converge on these matters of empirical fact independent of attributes, immutable characteristics like your skin color, your height, or your weight, etc. But but that yeah. idea itself is seen as oppressive to people. Yes. That our utterances are limited by our exogenous uh, traits. And, and to make that make any sense whatsoever, they need to smuggle in their own epistemology. So they need to push forward an epistemological driver of standpoint theory. Mm -hmm. And standpoint theory, well, we could talk about that, but that's basically how the system, that's how it works. That's how this whole game is played. Because yeah. if it wasn't played like that, people simply wouldn't believe this shit because it's in, most of it's insane. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's pure ideology. But it looks like it's built upon substantive research. It's kind of, I'm mm -hmm. hesitant to say this, but the closest analogy is probably turning a lot of people off, but it's true. So I'm, I am hesitant to say this, but the closest thing I can think of, if, if talk about gender and race is too emotional for people, et cetera, and, and uh, think about the biblical scholar N.T. Wright, who has produced these unbelievable tomes uh, about the resurrection of Jesus, and he builds upon other thinkers, et cetera, et cetera. The whole thing is laundered. Not in the same way, but it's like you build upon particular pieces of, I'm even hesitant to call them scholarship, but you build upon writings and then you create this thing at the top of the timeline. You're like, oh my God, this is, this is astonishing. Look at all the references. Look at how well researched it is. Look at how much data it takes in. But the, so is that clear? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to say the Achilles heel of this whole thing. Sorry, I didn't catch that last part. I, if, if everything is, I said is clear, I want to mention the Achilles heel of this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So, so the Achilles heel is what I said before, but I didn't expand upon it. Mm -hmm. There's no dialectic. Right. There's no. So because there's no, there's nothing in place in the system that affords or lauds, or even allows communicating with different ideas, it's not just an insularity, an ideologically insular, insularity mechanism. It prevents any kind of apologia from developing. It prevents any kind of apologetic or defense of the grievance studies ideology forever emerging. But that's why they have to resort to other tools, because they don't mm -hmm. have a defense of the ideology. And the biggest tool in the toolbox right now is racist. And then they, as I said before, then they construct 
mechanisms in the university to enforce that if someone's called a racist. Mm -hmm. So this ideology is built on a house of cards. Now, if you had said to me three or four years ago, if you say, hey, man, how do we this is some serious shit. These people are thinking that stuff is true. Unlike Christians, they don't need faith because they think it's all based on evidence. It's not based on any evidence. It, everything's been idea laundered. What do we do about this? I could have told you exactly what we do. But now, with everything that's going on, the ideology is manifesting itself. It is not a continuation of the civil rights of the civil rights movement in the, in the United States. Mm-hmm. So the question is, how do we take so, okay, so I've just said a ton of stuff. So let's <laughs> let's pause. How, how are we doing? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, we can continue. Well, I don't know. I don't want to make it a monologue. So yeah, no, it, it, it's um, it's all right. I, I I just you know I mean when I see these uh, these initiatives, the one that I mentioned before, this shut down STEM, and right. uh, the enthusiasm that they they seem to generate among uh, scientists and researchers right. in, 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 in the natural sciences. I that's mean, because that's because their yeah. moral minds have overridden their natural exactly. minds. It's because what exactly. Jonathan Haidt said in The Righteous Mind, morality binds and blinds, terrific example of that. He's absolutely correct. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an unprecedented, it, seem, it seems to me, unprecedented victory for yes. this ideology in, in, in the STEM fields. Uh, I, I've been really struck uh, in, in the past few days. Not just the STEM fields, it's an unprecedented... I said to Carl Benjamin, we did an event together, I said, these, these people are winning the culture war. It was like two or three years ago. And he said to me, no, 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 they're not, they're not winning the culture war. And he pointed to you know, comments on YouTube. Well, uh, mm-hmm. they're winning the call. I think I was a little surprised by that. Um, but I, I think the, the point was well noted at the time. But now, yeah. but here's the thing. Here's what, what's so important. And in, in this utter madness, in this, you know, the, the most, I, I have engaged people who traffic in insane ideas for my whole career. And abolishing mm-hmm. the police department is one of the most insane ideas I have ever heard. So how do we still take the concerns of people who have been historically marginalized, take them seriously and put in safeguards so that, and I'm not an expert in this, I don't know the data. There's going to be a good uh, a conversation between Ali Rivzi, who wrote The Atheist Muslim, uh, who have nothing but respect and good things to say about, and my very good friend, Matt Thornton, who's one of the first... Brazilian jiu-jitsu, black belts in the United States. He trains police officers. <laughs> They're going to have a great conversation on Wiki Letter about systemic mm-hmm. racism and, and uh, uh, shootings of unarmed black men. Uh, so I, I would urge readers, that's another, uh, that's a dialectic, right? That's a rule, rule right. engagement. That's a dialectic. Someone presents this, other person presents this, and it's not, there's no conversation or someone, you instantly go to racist. No, you look at the evidence and the data and you talk about it. And in that way, if there's a problem, you can address it. And so we have to make sure, in spite of all of the lunacy of abolishing the police departments, you know, people who genuinely want to free, who want to close all prisons. Okay, th- this is a fringe group of people. Now, n- not the police department, but, but the, um, the prisons. How do we make sure that we move the civil rights forward of people, particularly African-Americans, who have been victims of, of systemic discrimination? How do we take their concerns seriously? There is simply no reason that they should be afraid of the police. That is a huge problem that we have to address. We have to move forward because it's a common problem that we all share. And the way to do that is to not riot and shoot police officers. And I mean, we, we know how not to do that, right? The number of ways, like Toynbee said about the family, the number of ways that a family can be dysfunctional is more or less infinite. The number of ways they can be functional are very few. So we know how to make sure these concerns 
you, you don't want to alienate people, and you certainly don't want to give anybody any ammunition so that Trump gets in again. So how do you move forward? Well, the way you move forward is peaceful demonstrations, protests. I know in Portland it's an epicenter of madness over here. The, the way that you move forward is conversation, which is why I wrote a whole book about it, dialogue, communication, genuinely listening to what someone has to say, and most importantly, the scientific method. We have to look at what the evidence is and formulate public policy accordingly. It's very difficult to do that. The waters are muddied when things are masquerading as science in peer-reviewed journals that are simply not science. Yeah, and this was the, um, the starting point of the conversation. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I've reached the end of my questions. I don't want to take too much of your time, but is there something you, you think um, I should have asked you about and I didn't? Um, uh, let me think. I mean, I kind of spoke a lot because there's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> there is. Um, I think, I, no, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think that there is a way ahead. And yeah. the way ahead... I think there's not a way ahead in some things. I think that mm -hmm. the, that we've irrevocably lost, or at least in, in the short term, trust in our public institutions, again, lending to the legitimation crisis. But I think that there's a way forward for individuals. One way, I'll give you a few, few things, I think, is to let friends be wrong. We wrote about this in How to Have Impossible Conversation. You, you don't have to believe absolutely everything that your friend believes. And if they have a small difference of opinion, that doesn't make them a bad person. That just makes them someone who you disagree with. Now, there are deal breakers in conversations, right? You know, like, I don't know, someone's a child rapist or something. I mean, there are obviously deal breakers in a conversation or deal breakers mm -hmm. in a relationship or et cetera. And then, you, but the best way to do that, if someone has a belief you don't agree with is to just listen to what they're saying. Of course, the extreme example I use doesn't work, but uh, in almost all normal cases, that will work. So that's one thing. Second thing is we have to learn because it's not been modeled for us in university culture. We have to learn how to start ta talking to people again. We have to learn how to start listening to people. And we have to learn how to ask the right questions, how to ask good questions. You know, Socrates was a master at that. In the Mino, <clears throat> he talks to the slave boy. He talks about what is justice in the Republic. All of his dialogues in the Theatetus, he talks about knowledge. All of his dialogues, they're just masterpieces in that. So you don't have to buy my book. Just read the Socratic dialogues. Okay. <laughs> or, or check out the street epistemology resources. So right. he, here's the other thing we have to do. We have to stand up to bullies. Right. So yeah. we have this horrific thing now. They're trying to cancel J.K. Rowling. Everybody's being canceled. I gave a talk in, in London about this. We have to stand up to cancel culture. There's a, something wonderful about being uh, ignored or canceled, etc. And that is you're even more to fr speak freely. And the Greeks have a word for that. It's called parahesia. I did a talk on it at um, few years ago on, on YouTube, you can find it for the James Randi Educational Foundation, but it's speaking truth in the face of danger. Foucault, oddly enough, writes about it, but it's, we, we need to speak up when, when we see that something is wrong or when something is happening to somebody who's a good person. You know, now people are posting <clears throat> with no evidence whatsoever. Oh, this business is racist. This business is racist. It's like 12, 12 businesses on a single block. With no evidence. And then there's like a kind of a horde mentality. So, so we have to speak up. At, and, and the other thing I want to say quickly is that we are in the middle of a moral panic right now. And it, it would be myopic of me to say that this moral panic is somehow different or unique. It always seems that way when you're in the middle of a moral panic. You know, everybody can understand McCarthyism as a moral panic, but few people can understand this as a moral panic. The way to address issues of whatever the issue is, racism, discrimination, whatever it is, it's not by doing radical things. If you truly want to abolish the police department, you better have a goddamn good plan in place. You better have a thoughtful, considered plan 
for exactly what you're going to do when some lunatic goes around and starts murdering people. And if you don't have that, then I would suggest sincerely reconsidering your plan. <laughs> and that seems like an eminently reasonable note to end on. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Peter, for coming on the on the podcast. I was really looking forward to it, and, and I'm very happy it happened. Thanks for having me. It's it's pretty complicated stuff. I'm sorry I talked so much. It's just there's so much information. There's just there so is. much stuff. You know, it, it's not. Look, if this were easy, we would have figured it out already. <laughs> the fact that there are so many confounding variables, there are so many things at play, moral there's sentiments, there's university. I, there's just so much at play right now. There's, it's such a complicated idea that we need to take a deep breath, slow down, mm. go back to the basics, de-escalate the situation, start thinking about, just truly, truly, I just took a deep breath, start thinking about what we all want in physics, we call it appeal to superordinate identities. So instead of breaking people down into further, ever more minute classifications, what do we have in common? I just retweeted a great video of a middle-aged black guy buying uh, four or five middle-aged white cops lunch. The cops were like, no, no, no. And the black guy was adamant on it. That's what we need to do. We need to build bridges We don't need to be screaming. The time for screaming, there was never a time for screaming at people. That doesn't change anybody's belief. We have to start listening and talking to each other again. Yes, hopefully we can do that. Um, um, well, cool, man. Well, thanks for having me on, bro. I appreciate it. And tag me on Twitter when it comes out and then send me a, a, sure. a DM and then I'll, re yeah. I'll just retweet whatever it is. Will do. Thank you so much. All right, Vincent. All right thanks, bro. Later. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Liberté Académique. We are a science, critical thinking and freedom podcast. We interview researchers, teachers and authors who have interesting ideas and who defend free, rational, evidence-based thought. We oppose as best we can a sort of anti-intellectualism coming from a section of the intellectual class. We carry out interviews in English and in French. You can find all our episodes on YouTube and on SoundCloud, as well as on the main podcasting platforms such as iTunes, Stitcher and several others. We are also present on Twitter at Freedom, and also on Facebook 